My name is Molly Bates, and I am a graphic designer at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, which we also call the CFPB. And my name is Ben Guen. I'm a user experience designer at the CFPB. So today we're going to start by talking about, uh, about the CFPB. We're going to talk briefly about what re regulations are and mandated disclosures, and then we'll share... Use the microphone. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Okay. And then we'll share a case study about designing disclosures for prepaid cards. Uh, so I'm going to start by asking you guys to use your imaginations for a minute. You don't have to close your eyes because we have some visual aids. Um, picture yourself shopping for a prepaid card. Uh, thousands of consumers use these to pay bills online, purchase things, um, and often as a replacement for a conventional bank account. So maybe you're in CVS or Walgreens, maybe you're online, um, and you begin to notice that all of the packaging, all the labels are very different. Um, and when you look at them side to side, the listed fees are very different. And you just don't know how to purchase. You're, you're getting frustrated and you're thinking to yourself, if only there were a federal agency responsible for mandating standardized disclosures for prepaid cards. Um, but you're in luck. That is us. Um, we are the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We're part of the federal government. And we're a new agency that's based in Washington, DC. We were created by the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act and officially opened our doors four years ago in July of 2011. We are an agency that helps consumer finance markets work by making rules more effective, by consistently and fairly enforcing those rules, and by empowering consumers to take more control over their economic lives. In the wake of the financial crisis, Congress created the CFPB to be a single point of accountability for enforcing federal consumer protection laws and, and protecting consumers in the financial marketplace. Before, that responsibility was spread across many different agencies, but today it's our job. And when we're talking about consumer financial products, we're talking about things like mortgages, student loans, credit cards, auto loans, and products um, like prepaid cards and payday loans. So day to day, this is what we do. We, we write we write the rules that regulate the financial market. We supervise companies to make sure they're following the rules. And we enforce those rules if they're not being followed. Um, and these rules help you know, protect against unfair, deceptive, and abusive practices. We also take consumer complaints about financial products. And we promote financial education. We research consumer behavior. And we monitor financial markets for new risks to consumers. And again, we enforce those laws um, like fair lending laws that prevent unfair treatment and discrimination. So Molly, uh, Molly and I work on the design and development team. Um, here's some of our numbers. We've been doing a lot of hiring. A number of our staff are in the room, so definitely talk to us if you're interested in working here. Um, so the CFPB has a total staff of around 1,600, and our design and development team uh, numbers are around 60 um, of designers, developers, and related staff. So this, is, this large team allows us to do more in-house design and development work than most federal agencies. Uh, part of our staff is organized into scrum teams that work on projects for our website, like owning a home, paying for college. Um, we have a database for our, our consumer complaints that's open. Um, and then another group of us work for like an in-house creative services group um, that works on less web-centered projects, like disclosures. So we want to give you a brief civics lesson in case it's been a while since you took Poli Sci 101. Um, you may remember this Schoolhouse Rock video where Just a Bill um, tells children how difficult it is for a bill to pass through Congress and become a law. And it is difficult. Um, but there's a lot of work after that. Um, bills that pass give federal agencies like ours the authority to implement the statutes in the bills by enforcing and creating regulations. CFPB does both of these things. We enforce existing regulations, and we amend or write new ones. Most regulations start as a proposed rule, which are, op which are then open for comments from the public for a certain period of time. You may remember when the open internet rule was open, you, you probably were seeing calls to comment all over your Twitter feed. Um, after that time period of commenting, the agency re reviews the comments and issues a final rule that includes an effective date for when the industry has to comply. So in this case, the, the, uh, the statute or the law is the Truth in Lending Act, and the regulation is Regulation Z. So uh, many consumer 
protection regulations these days include requirements for mandated disclosures. And what are those? Something like this, the nutrition facts la label. This is a great example. And we're wondering how many of you have ever done this behavior in the store, held two nutrition facts up next to each other. Anybody? No? Everybody. Yes? Oh, yeah. great. Cool. Everybody. Um, so the nutrition facts label is a mandatory disclosure. And it's supposed to help you comparison shop to make healthier choices. Um, disclosures can, can change consumer behavior. For example, I do this all the time. And right now, I'm currently looking a lot at uh, grams of sugar in packaging. And I usually make a choice based on that. Um, but disclosures also have the potential to change the industry's behavior. For example, when restaurants um, are required to show calorie counts on their menus, there's evidence that the food they're offering actually gets healthier. So a little bit more about this disclosure, since it's probably the one you're most familiar with. Um, the original label is on the left, and it's from 1995. The disclosure is regulated by the Food and Drug Administration, which is part of the US Department of Health and Human Services. Um, in March 2014, the FDA issued a new rule, or proposed a new rule, that would update the nutrition facts label to the design on your right. And you can see that uh, with this redesign, they've emphasized calories and kind of created a new hierarchy on the label. Um, you haven't seen this on your cereal box yet because this summer, in July 2015, they issued a supplement to the proposed rule. So they needed to change some more things and get more comments. Um, so that comment period is open right now. And if you have any thoughts, you're welcome to comment by October 13th. So when this, when this comment period ends, They'll review the comments, and they'll issue a final rule. And then this will show up on your cereal box. And just to note that the FDA worked with outside designers on both of these label designs. So another example of a, of a disclosure that you may have seen are the fuel economy labels that the Environmental Protection Agency requires to be placed in the windows of cars at auto lots that are for sale. Um, so similar to the calorie count in the proposed uh, nutrition facts label, this is featuring a most important number in the 26 miles per gallon. But you'll notice that they also include um, individually the city and highway miles per gallon. And they've done some math and calculated estimates for annual fuel costs and sa fuel savings. And they show with some sliders some ratings for uh, environmental um, status and then um, but the miles per gallon is still the most prominent thing on the page based off of size and weight. Uh, there have additional types of disclosures for different types of cars. So for plug-in hybrid vehicles, they've decided to include a lot more information, um, including driving range and number of gallons per 100 miles. Um, and this is where the complexity starts to get to be information overload. Um, and you need to start questioning whether all of this information is really important to see on the car lot, or whether there's other places where you could be providing it. Um, but that said, because it's a standardized format, it's really easy to see which of these cars has the better miles per gallon, which of them's going to cost more over time. Another uh, disclosure that we see a lot in our, um, in our work in consumer finance is, the, is this box, part of, which is part of the Truth in Lending Act. Uh, so I got this as part of a car loan a couple years ago in New York State. And at the beginning of the top row of information, it includes the annual percentage rate, um, or APR. And that's a common, commonly used metric to help compare different loans. But then it does the math for you in the next box for the finance charge. And that's the amount that the APR will cost you over the term of the loan. Um, and it includes some additional information about like the number of payments, the amount of payments, when they start becoming due, um, all in this standardized format. However, when I got this disclosure, it was among dozens of other state and local disclosures. Um, and so I didn't really pay attention to it that much. So it's one of the things that's important for us to think about is um, what is the context in which the disclosure is actually going to be shown to people? Um, because that will impact whether it's actually readable. So uh, another example of mandated disclosure is uh, the set of forms that you get when you apply for and close on a mortgage. And the CFPB has two new disclosures that are actually coming to your local lender this Saturday. Um, we've been working on amendments to the regulation that regulates this area for four years. And um, the redesign of, of these forms is finally hitting your lender now. Um, so the forms are called the loan estimate and the closing disclosure. 
Um, the loan estimate combines um, what, what, what were two old disclosures that were actually regulated by two different government agencies into one. So it, the loan estimate replaces the good faith estimate and the truth in lending disclosure. The form highlights the most important elements of your mortgage and allows for easier comparisons among competing lenders. So the consumer behavior we're looking for here is for consumers to go from lender to lender, get multiple loan estimates and compare them to find the best deal for their situation. Um, the closing disclosure also combines two old disclosures, the HUD-1 settlement statement and the Truth in Lending Act. Um, this, this form, the closing disclosure, mirrors the loan estimate. They look very similar so that you can easily compare and check to see that the loan you were offered is, is the same as the loan you're finally closing on. Um, we'll talk to you a bit more about this project later and sort of how we've closed the loop. So there's a lot of ways... So there's a lot of ways to, uh, to design and think about these disclosures. But one thing that you might still be thinking is like, well, why don't you just include less information? Like, why don't you make it radically simple? Um, and that's possible, and there are ca but there are caveats. So in 2010, uh, the health department in New York City started requiring restaurants to post a letter grade from their latest sanitary inspection near their entrances. And it had a noticeable effect on behavior of both the consumers and the restaurant owners. Consumers ex express caution when considering a restaurant that had like a B or a C grade, and then restaurants, when getting a lower grade, requested additional sanitary inspections so they could get a higher grade. Um, NYC later published data showing a 14% reduction in the first full year after this was implemented uh, in salmonella poisoning hospital visits, which was the lowest they'd seen in 20 years. Um, and they suggested that was possibly because consumers were going to healthier or more sanitary restaurants, or be also because restaurants were becoming more sanitary in order to get better inspections. Um, that said, it's an aggressive simplification. It doesn't explain why a restaurant got a low grade, and there's a lot of different reasons why that aren't necessarily what you would define as sanitary. Um, and that information is available on the website, but the call to action to go to the website is pretty small. So high-level considerations that we're thinking about when we're designing disclosures are to use a structured format so consumers can make comparisons, to be careful about adding any additional information because it makes the other stuff less prominent, to understand the context in which the disclosure is going to be shown, to prioritize what's, uh, what should be most prominent uh, based off of the behaviors uh, you're looking for. Um, so we're gonna show you an example of taking these considerations into action with our prepaid credit card disclosures. Um, I've been working on this project for almost two years and it's pretty cool thing that our in-house design team gets to work on this disclosure. Um, so the first thing that we did when we started this project was to learn a lot about the product and the consumers who use it. Um, this should be a pretty familiar scene. If you haven't noticed this at um, your local grocery store or pharmacy, you know, look around next time you're there and you'll find a rack like this. Um, prepaid cards are sold at most grocery stores and pharmacies. They're different from gift cards. These are reloadable and kind of act as an alternative to a bank account. Um, many consumers use them to avoid overdraft fees at banks. They've been burned before or they want to kind of be off the grid or they use it for budgeting. Um, but the cards still give them the, the ability to use an ATM or shop online. Um, one in 11 consumers in America report that they've used a prepaid card at least monthly. And use of these cards has jumped by 50% from 2012 to 2014. But here's the rub. Um, some of these cards can have a lot of fees. The Center for Financial Services found more than 60 possible fees across all these different cards. Right, and a lot of the fees have different terms for them. Um, and so we wanted to get a better idea of what consumers cared about when they shop for prepaid cards and how they considered different fees. So we held uh, four 90-minute focus groups near DC. Um, and uh, it was total about 40 different prepaid card customers. Uh, they told us that low fees, ATM coverage, and brand recognition were the main components they looked for when like shopping around for what would be the best prepaid card for them. And when we asked them to compare different fees, they told us that the monthly fee, the cash reload fee, and the ATM withdrawal fees were the most important. So those might be the ones that we wanted to make most prominent on the form. Um, we also asked them to brainstorm all the possible fees they could ever think of, um, and that helped give us an idea of the different terms they used for different types of fees. Um, we also asked them 
if they actually researched fees before they purchased the card. Only half of them said that they did. Um, some of them said that they really only learned about fees after they were charged th those fees. Um, but they said that they thought that they could go online to find fee information, um, but they just didn't. So that sort of, sort of supported the theory that if we made this information more easily available, that then they could look at it more often. So we also looked at what other groups had suggested doing for disclosing this information. Um, we work in an industry where a lot of adv advocacy, advocacy groups work in advance of government regulation to kind of suggest ways to solve these problems. Um, and in this example, Pew Research Center um, kind of designed a suggestion for prepaid disclosure well ahead of when we started our project. Um, the really unique constraint to this disclosure is the packaging. Um, and we're not attempting to change that size and shape. So it's kind of a great design great and tough design constraint from the very beginning. And they call this the J-hook packaging for the hook that it sits on. So Pew Research Center suggested disclosing, disclosing all the fees um, on the card on the packaging itself using a three-tier fold-out. So once it's folded out, this disclosure includes every single fee, along with a fee type, description, and a further description of the amount. Um, you can see there's basic, there's like a category. So there's five or six columns of information on this fee table, which is a lot. Um, so after all this initial research, focus groups, market research, um, we got to get started designing options for the disclosure. Um, the principles that we've used for designing the disclosure are very basic design principles. Um, we use them every day in all of our other work, and you know nothing's stopping us from using them here. Um, we want to use plain language, which is reader-focused language written at like a seventh grade level, not using a lot of jargon. Uh, we want to use a clear information hierarchy, ample white space, simple typography, consistent and logical alignment, and grouping in categories to help readers read this disclosure. So here's the, sh the uh, sort of solution where we're at with the proposed rule. This rule is not final yet. Um, so uh, this is the short form. So we decided early on to not do a full fee disclosure on the packaging, but instead go for a summary disclosure. And, and then let the user access the long form, so the full fee disclosure, um, that would look like this. And they could, they could access this um, in paper form if they got this prepaid card at a bank, or they can access it in a retail store by um, going to the URL that the company um, serves up. And um, they can also call a phone number on the form. So there's a lot of different ways they can get to the long form, but they're all before they purchase the card. So it got kind of hard to talk about all these different ways and all the comparisons that were happening. Um, so pretty early on, we, we helped our team by creating a diagram to help illustrate the different scenarios. So if you're in a store, you're comparing A and B, and then you get long form A and B, um, and then you ultimately get to the purchase. And this is a, a, a role that designers can play on teams like this, is really help visualize problems to further the conversation and kind of keep people from talking in circles. So in this design, we worked hard to build a clear hierarchy for the consumer, despite the many different ways consumers use the product. There isn't one single fee we can highlight because there's different types of consumers using these for different reasons. So the top line, let's see if I can do this. It's the button in the middle. The top line um, highlights the fees that um, we believe are most important when consumers are shopping for a prepaid account. We think they're most important because consumers told us and market data is telling us this. Um, the proposed form only includes 10 total fees. Um, so three of them are designated at, as incidence-based fees, which basically means that the company has to calculate the most commonly charged fees um, and put that, those specifically on their package. So from, from card to card, these will be different. And this prevents companies from changing their fee structures to make their product appear less expensive based on these static fees. <laughs> and it also makes the disclosure more dynamic and respond to changes in the marketplace and consumer use patterns. And there's a bunch of other five print, and there's sort of additional, we charge X number of other fees to kind of prompt people to um, go to the long form if they're interested in that, in learning about the additional fees. We've also proposed that the short form include a link to our website for more general information about prepaid cards. 
but this site is not built yet. So as soon as we had versions of the disclosure that we thought could perform well, we wanted to get insights from consumers about, um, about what they thought and how it performed. Um, so I'll start by saying that there are op a lot of different options for testing disclosures and testing different things that you're working on. Um, so you can get rich qualitative feedback from things like scheduled in-person interviews with a moderator from online services that record a participant's responses to prompts. You can also do like guerrilla tests in locations um, that you might have interested participants. Guerrilla meaning that you kind of just sneak up on them. Um, and then you can also get more objective feedback um, more and quantitative feedback from things like surveys and A-B testing or um, in-person testing with larger sample sizes. So for uh, testing these prepaid cards, um, we did three rounds of one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, and so these gave us qualitative feedback throughout the design process. Uh, we conducted sessions across the country, and we rec specifically recruited participants who identified as prepaid card customers. Um, so in each of these sessions with participants, we started off with just questions about their experience with prepaid cards. In some cases, we found out that they were actually gift card customers, and they thought that they were the same thing. Um, and then we had them imagine that they're in a store, similar to, as we did before with you guys, uh, and then showed them a version of the packaging with our disclosure on it. Um, had them read through it and ask them questions about, um, about the form and about the product to, to see whether they understood the disclosure. So for example, we asked them how much it would cost to use this card at an ATM. And on the disclosure, there's a version for a fee for in-network and out-of-network. And so when we asked them that question, we got to see whether they understood that the fees were different for in-network or out-of-network. Um, we also gave them two different cards with different fees on them, so we were able to see if the behavior worked of them comparing the disclosures on different, uh, the fees on different disclosures. So what we learned was that participants were able to identify and use the fee information. Um, they also understood that the short form was an abbreviated list of fees. Um, which was something we had worried about because we didn't want to take out a lot of the other fees and put them on the long form, and then consumers think that those form fees just don't exist. Um, so based off of the prompt and the information shown, they understood that more fees do exist, and they understood how they could find them if they were interested. But they told us also that um, the fees that were listed did give them enough information to um, purchase. Uh, we also made some small edits based on participants' understanding of different terms and formatting. So for example, we were using a slash in between variables to indicate either or, and consumers didn't understand that in early rounds of testing. So we just changed that to the word or, and that performed a lot better. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You guys can come up, in if you want. It took up more space, though. So. Yeah, there's so many feeds. <laughs> come on in. Um, <laughs> We do want to say that um, every team member had the opportunity to um, go to the testing or, or you know, log on and watch the testing. So that included our economists and lawyers and researchers um, were really involved with the testing and got to hear the consumer insights directly. Um, so once we designed and tested these forms, we had to work with our colleagues to actually get the specifications written into the regulation, the proposed regulation. Um, and this is where a cozy relationship with your policymakers and your designers is really important because you want to make sure that they understand the intent of your design and the actual specifications of your design. And they are in charge of turning it into language like this, um, which is basically saying it needs to be an easy to read typeface in black and white. Um, and this is just a tiny portion of the regulation. So. We also had the opportunity to include details about technology um, in the final, in the proposed rule. Um, so we wanted to avoid any details that were going to seem stale in five to ten years, but it was also an opportunity to set rules that affect usability, like setting maximum lengths for URLs and mandating that online disclosures be viewable across different screen sizes. Um, we also set rules so that disclosures could be more accessible for future applications and services, uh, specifically that they're Machine, the information is machine readable, and that an online version of the disclosure isn't just an image file of the disclosure. Um, and that also has the, the ability to make it more accessible for screen readers and assistive devices. Um, here is an example of 
uh, the proposed reg for the maximum length of the URL. We've also proposed that it be meaningfully named. Um, and the aim for that is so that people don't have to uh, remember a random jumble of characters and enter that onto their phone. So uh, then we propose the rule. So design, testing, um, getting it into the, into the actual words of the rule, we propose it. This happened in November of 2014. Um, and when we proposed the rule, we did a little bit of marketing and PR to kind of tell people about it. Um, so we publicized the rule with um, photos and illustrations. We, we did mock-ups and shot them in drugstores. And we pushed these out to our blog and social media channels so that average consumers might be interested in engaging in the process um, and commenting. Um, we'll do a much bigger push once the, once the rule is final and we want consumers to be aware that this new disclosure is hitting, hitting their drugstore. Um, during the open comment period, um, the prepaid card disclo disclosed rule received over 150 comments from industry groups, trade organizations, consumer groups, and other interested parties. And then we also received 35,000 comments through two online comment writing campaigns. Um, our colleagues reviewed all of these comments and worked to consider the, the points that they made. Um, we have a lot of new work we'd love to show you on these prepaid cards, but we can't show you until the rule is final. So our next steps are to finish adjusting the designs and details based on the, the public comments and the changes we're making after the proposed rule. Um, we've done a few additional rounds of testing. Um, then we're going to design and develop that URL that's on the disclosure, cfpb.gov slash prepaids. And then um, we'll issue the final rule. And that will include an effective date for when the industry has to comply. Yeah, so this website, CF cfpb.gov slash prepaids, um, we can tell you what it might look like. Uh, so just to remind you guys, this is the link at the bottom of the disclosure that gives people more information about prepaid cards in case that they're shopping around. Um, and we've done a similar page uh, for our mortgage forms. So this is the loan estimate disclosure, and it has a unique URL to consumerfinance.gov slash mortgage estimate. Um, and that takes the consumer to a landing page that's designed specifically for people who are arriving via that URL. And it provides information that the consumer can use at that exact moment with clear action steps. So at the top right, there's a link to our loan estimate explainer. Um, and that's a page that has an interactive tool that helps people understand the different terms and sections of the disclosure form. So this is what they're holding in their hands right now and a web accompaniment to under explain it. And then there's some other web pages and a suite of tools that we call owning a home that give them more, more information about how to shop around for a mortgage. So take these insights back home for you, with you for this and similar work. Um, understand when, where, and how your disclosure is going to be presented. Think about the behavior that you want to result from the disclosure. Use hierarchy, logical grouping, and other design principles when designing. Schedule testing throughout the design process and have the entire team attend testing. Um, and then provide model forms for what it should look like, but then also pay attention to how design and technology are written in the final rule. And one point I, th I think we left out okay. is then close the loop with consumer-facing, consumer education tools so that they have the opportunity to get more information. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's it. Thanks. Um, do you guys have any questions for us? Erie. If I'm interested in working on this, oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> if I want to come work with you, how could I do that? If you want to join our team, um, we are ha currently hiring UX, uh, a UX lead, a manager. Um, we will soon be hiring front end developer manager um, and back end developer enterprise management positions. So those are happening in the very near future. Um, you can also join our team through our fellowship, which most of us in the room are part of. And that's the sort of regular um, cadence that will probably be summer, summer of next year um, that we start that hiring process. So we'd love to have as many um, interested parties, UX, um, developers, design, data, cybersecurity, um, come chat with us. Um, we, we're always looking for really great people to join our team. And uh, the fellowship allows you to work 100% remote. So um, Ben works in Austin. I work in DC. And uh, our team has worked really hard to make that a strong part of our culture and kind of make it really easy and seamless to work remotely from your home. Other questions? Is anybody um, 
seeing similar problems or have an opportunity to work, to work on regulation at the city or local, state, federal level in the audience? Yeah? I'm working a lot on privacy disclosures. I'm sorry, I missed most of the presentation. That's okay. Oh, interesting. So we're trying to balance that, like, that risk aversion, putting all the legal tech you can on it, and then whether it's just slapping a user-friendly version on top of the nasty legal stuff, mm -hmm. kind of what that consumer-friendly, regulator-friendly experience. Well, we're a regulator, and we want to be consumer-friendly. <laughs> Hopefully those things align. Um, but what is the context that the, the user gets the disclosure? So uh, this would be privacy disclosures on the web, so as you're browsing. Okay. Uh, so as you're browsing the web, you go to a website. Every website should have some kind of privacy policy that tells you how your data is being treated, okay. mm -hmm. saved, not saved. But really, it's just a, a long list of mays, like conditionals. Your data may be, we may do this, we may do that, we may do this. So they just want to cover their um, bases. Bases. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All the bases. Yes. <laughs> because really, there's this obscure regulator called the FTC that might get them for anything that's misleading um, the consumer. Uh -huh. So the standard's really nebulous, so then the industry just is completely non-consumer friendly because they're afraid of saying anything specific. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, one thing to your point, though, about how the, the lawyers want to include all certain types of information, like outside of any understanding of what a consumer would actually be able to read. One thing we found at, at the CFPB is useful for combating that habit is just doing what they say and putting it in front of users. Um, Erie was one of our early, our early staff doing so. Um, <laughs> and uh, putting it in front of consumers, having them attend, um, and, and having them see like what you're doing doesn't work. Like you're not actually getting the desired behavior. So, and then you can have another conversation the next morning uh, and be like, okay, so how do we proceed from here? Okay, we got one in the back. Question in the back. And then just another example of awesome. kind of designing around regulation. So I'm, I'm an interaction designer, UX designer. Uh -huh. Work for state government in Massachusetts. We've been building an application for the last year around, that's going to be the application for public housing. Uh -huh. um, how you apply for pub state-aided public housing. And so it's been really interesting trying to create interfaces that work around regulation, at sometimes at the cost of usability. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, in Massachusetts you get housing preference based on where you live and where you work. But ideally, and so ideally in the interface, I would just be able to tell you, apply to these two housing authorities. But I can't. Hmm. Because there's a law against a state agency making recommendation of that because it constitutes something called steering. So I can't tell you where you need to live. So I have to put this kludgy interface together, which is not usable. Well, I mean, it's as usable as we can make it. But it's not the most ideal user interface around to get around this law. Hmm. So it's another interesting example, like in the interactive space of trying to like figure out how to navigate people through the law. Or right, Erie has a response to that. If you questions. So I just worked. <laughs> by the way, can we do a special round of applause for these guys? <laughs> um, this is real hard stuff, and I'm like bottom of my heart, proud of you. Um, so I just worked on a project called College Scorecard with the Department of Education. And the Department of Education is not going to say the school is right for you, this school is wrong for you. There's not like a specific law. It's just not like not a super useful thing for the government to say because that's one recommendation that everyone has to deal with. Um, the tack that we did to try and address that constraint was we didn't launch the College Scorecard. We launched um, an open API and the scorecard on top of it, and we launched with a dozen organizations that built their own recommendation tool on top of it. Hmm. So one of them was a place called I'm First that only serves first-generation college students, and one of them was PayScale, which is the source for all like salary data that everybody uses commercially. So I guess like my question would be, if there's you know, five community groups that are external, but if there are like five community groups with the largest user bases, is there a way, we have the same problem in reverse mortgages where there's mandated um, consumer counseling if you want a rever reverse mortgage, but HUD's not gonna say, 
like a, a, a for real good thing for America would be an odometer that went from homeless to not homeless. And we can say, according to your data, we know you're going to be homeless if you get a reverse mortgage right now. Like the government's not going to do that. But one of the things we talked about a million years ago was the idea of like what if we could release their counseling information in machine readable format and ha work with all the community groups that are doing great work actually in the community for them to con consume it and then make whatever sort of odometer they thought made sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, what, what, would, what would be possible there? So one thing that I would say is like, just fight for the platform play as much as possible, like the machine readable data, because mm -hmm. like, one of the things that people don't do is comparison shop. It's, con it's already embarrassing to buy a financial product in a grocery store. But a lot of people are uncomfortable about doing that and they don't want, it's like buying like condoms or tampons. You don't want to have like five different versions and are like looking between them. So like the fact that you have machine readable disclosures that yeah. eventually these places that actually work directly in these communities can help them comparison shop wherever they do it or where they're comfortable. Like that's, that's really important. That was sort of a soliloquy, sorry. <laughs> So there's, so there's also a really amazing play at the municipal level, which is you go and teach librarians how to use your tool and how to do the steering one on one. That's all. <laughs> yeah, uh, yesterday, I can't remember who was speaking, but he had like these uh, concentric circles that was like um, user needs, software, and it went out and out and out to um, the law and kind of like start with the user needs and someday we'll get to the law. And the really cool thing about working at Consumer Financial Protection Bureau or any other government regulator is that you get to sort of, if, if you're there and, and you're able to get in there, you can affect the law, which is just like a kind of a tremendous opportunity. And I think, you know, we're looking for other examples where design and UX and developers get to have influence over that. Um, a little bit of influence, a tiny bit. Um, and you know we'd love to like find more examples of that because it's a pretty cool opportunity and uh, one of the great, great uh, potential, uh, big potentials of working in this space. So I think your slide said that um, most people said they they understood that the it was the information was just a summary mm -hmm. of the fees um, from those that said that they didn't understand. That that was just a summary. I was I'm curious if there was any insightful or interesting feedback you, you could glean from those who who thought that there should be more disclosure of, of all the fees. Yeah. So um, where's my laser pointer? Nice. Uh, um, so we have a line right here that says we charge six other fees not listed here. Um, this is what came out of four rounds of testing. Um, so we had different language. Um, we tried out different language throughout different rounds of testing. Um, and what a lot of participants said was like, wait, what? Like, what are the other fees? Why aren't you showing me what those are? Um, like, they like wanted to see all of the fees, which is actually the behavior that we wanted. We wanted people to be thinking about, like, what are all of the costs of this card? Um, we didn't include all of them because, all of them right here, because then it would be hard, impossible to read anything. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we learned that they were interested in it, and then we asked them if they would go to this website to learn more about the fees. Most of them said they would. Um, we will see in actual market behavior, you know, after we release the rule, uh, about how often that actually happens. Thank you. Yeah, and considering that m most people are not considering the fees pre-purchase, um, I think it's kind of going to be a rare consumer that wants to see the like a more more than a dozen fees. Um, to make that comparison. And so we really prioritize that short list to just get them to look at a few. And maybe just the top four, then maybe six below that, and then they could go further if they wanted, but it's sort of like a staged entry point. Do you have any plans to study the outcomes of the final design once it's implemented? Very good question. I do not have plans personally to do it. Um, CFPB. I, yeah, there I, is a, we can find that out for you. Yeah, there. I think yeah. there's, Erie might know about more about this. There's like a five year look back thing that happens for regulations like this. And so that's the time when they would work to design um, 
any research or studies to check the effectiveness of this disclosure. And I'm sure our Office of Research will have great ideas for that. So, what, like, there's a look back to assess whether it's effective, and then there are things like, I, I don't know if you know about the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act. In other areas, there's excellent data about applic applicants, like the demographics and the financial background, what happens to them, and what happens as a result of that. And that's actually where you can find things like evidence of discrimination that otherwise are impossible. Something like that does not exist in the prepaid market today. Mm -hmm. But having this as a sort of turning point and having look back and having um, the opportunity to show the impact on the um, market that some of this information actually has makes this possible. So if any of y'all work at a think tank, paper suggestion. <laughs> <laughs> um. One, one thing that is exciting is that we are also responsible for that cfpb.gov slash prepaid page. Um, so that'll be launching with the rule um, in early 2016. And um, as we get more people there, we're, we're, we'll be able to iteratively change it and see if that affects behavior, um, because that is owned by our, our team that's able to develop it over time. Did you have a question? Oh. You know, you guys have already tackled bigger things like the student loans and mortgages, and right now you've got this prepaid card thing that I would have never thought of. So my question is, like, what's the dream project or what's that one thing that you guys want to work on next? I mean, there's so many things, but... <laughs> well, we're working on a couple of really great, juicy, upcoming disclosure-like products um, that we can't tell you about, but they're pretty dreamy. We could tell you, you what think? they are. Can we? You're making it sound so scary. I, I, I don't know if we can, but. <laughs> no, so we, uh, we submitted a notice of proposed rulemaking in go. the spring um, for uh, payday loans, for small dollar loans, the payday loans, title loans, other installment loans for uh, without, with like a balloon payment or um, without any sort of security other than, other than like your paycheck. Um, so that. Uh, we're working on what exactly is going to be in that rule and doing some testing currently for that, which is pretty great. Good job, guys. Yeah, and the deeper you go down all these, you know, you th the first things you think of are mortgages and student loans, but the further you get down into these sort of um, niche products or, or just products that sort of average middle class person isn't interacting with, well, like, juicier the problems get and like bigger potential for really helping people who are struggling. Well, I was wondering, not to be too much of a devil's advocate, but there's so much literature out there that there's like disclosure-itis, no one can deal with disclosure, and no amount of good UX or good visual design can really get over the hump of people yeah. just tuning out everything, that we're just at a point in our lives where we will not engage even if it looks nice. So I was wondering if you've ever thought about just being totally kind of behavioralist or following like the persuasive tech, just channeling people into behavior instead of trying to really engage them with details and educating them. That seems to be the other hypothesis just force them into wisdom instead of trying to educate them into it. I think Ben has read a book on this. <laughs> I did read a book. Um, so our test, our, the, our usability testing said that this did actually impact behavior. So hopefully that you simulated the real world. You were forcing them to look world. at it, yes. right? You were forcing them to That's look true. at it. In the first place. That's true. Yeah, so it, it, it comes with the assumption that people will look on the back and read something. Um, so... Uh, I, I, I disagree that no amount of UX can help. I think as much UX as you can is the only thing that will help at all. <laughs> like, um, and so that's definitely what we were trying to do is com compete with the fact that like people just don't read a lot on things. Like They're busy. They, they have other things on their minds. Um, so we're hoping that this is, uh, that this is going to be effective despite those constraints. However, um, in our notice for rulemaking for, for small dollar loans, um, we note about certain legal restrictions against certain types of loans, um, meaning that certain loans just uh, won't be structured in the ways that are as predatory anymore. Um, so it's not a matter of creating a really great disclosure at the beginning of the origination process being like, you shouldn't take this out. It's a matter of just using our regulatory ability to just make, this, uh, make the marketplace a safer place. And to be honest, we're usually not in that conversation of should there be a disclosure or not. Um, that's, you know, 
a policy question sort of levels above us. Um, so when it comes to us, it's like, okay, there is going to be a disclosure. Let's make it the very best it can be. Um, but I think it's totally worth reading the and thinking about the the counterpoint and, and kind of thinking about the best, you know, having that be part of the conversation and how is your disclosure um, kind of addressing those problems. Yeah. Um, they actually, so CPB, because they're amazing, also has a like backdoor fail safe for this. So you can, let's say a company has a disclosure, but it's a lot of fine text. Um, if you use the product and are shocked about a fee and you're like, what in the world? Um, you can file a complaint with CFPB and say, like, I got charged a super weird fee. It doesn't seem right. Even if it was, if it was technically hidden in the fine print somewhere, that complaint, the company has to respond to it and it's published. And if you look at the industry papers in finance, they're saying to each other, like, oh, if you don't want to be the worst in this database, you better design things to be even easier. So in fact, like in a dream world, and I do think it's oh, there's a huge point for a role for UX in the regulator to design the disclosures as, as well as possible. But there's also the, sort of this like, like real-time fail-safe, where if the disclosures are failing, if consumers are surprised by fees, surprised by charges that they weren't anticipating, because frankly, like consumer research shows the ones what we've done, and also the academic literature that people never think they're going to do the bad thing. They're like, oh, I'm never going to overdraft, so they don't look at that, or like, oh, I'm never going to bad, but like life happens, so. Even if the disclosure sucks, um, the CPB has been super thoughtful, whether it's like the, these giant databases or um, open data around complaints about how to try and make this sort of like a self-cleaning oven of a market to make mm -hmm. financial companies, frankly, more competitive. It's not perfect, but. Mm -hmm. can, can I ask a question? Yeah. Why did you guys come here? Like, this is pretty nerdy. What do yeah, you guys to do? this session. Like, yeah, that's sort of what I was asking if you guys had encountered this in, um, in your work or, you know, what, what brought you to this session? Good question, Yuri. Uh, yes. Um, I work on a lot of information design, I guess. Um, in general, uh, either like explaining some ho complicated policy or like explaining what's going on with like your city council, which nobody ever knows. Um, and a lot of it is kind of like content design and information design. And I actually came across the, um, the guide to buying a home that CFPB released pretty recently. And I was Your like, home loan toolkit? Yeah. I was like fangirling really hard over that. I designed that. <laughs> I was like, we can chat about that. I designed yeah, that. Yeah, that was amazing. I saw it and I was like, these are good designers. Uh, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> Thanks. Cool. Anyone else? Um, I no longer, I have a different job now, but I'm a veteran of ING Direct, um, RIP, <laughs> and who, who like was a financial institution who cared a lot about making this stuff clear and really worked really hard to, to do that. And then slowly through acquisition, you know, felt that getting sucked out of my brain. So, you know, I have, a, I have like a, just like a secret nerdy uh, lingering love for this stuff. <laughs> Anybody else? What brought you here? Was that you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, um, so I, I work at a planning agency, and we um, do a lot of housing analysis. And um, I love the way the CFPB does the um, HMDA Home Mortgage Disclosure Act awesome. open data portal. We we work really hard to try and make a lot of open data tools. And so awesome. The Anyway, that's why I'm at this session, kind of seeing, learning about your process and seeing how we can take it back home. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we could have done a talk like all the things that CFU does, which is actually a very hard talk to do because <laughs> it's a lot of things. I'm actually, I'm working on one from a design side for in a couple of weeks, and it's just really hard. Um, but uh, if you want to know more about sort of all the different things we do and how we do it, we're happy to chat about that after. Um, we're super proud of everything, so we'd love to talk about it. I'm here because that man here helped hire me nine months ago. So. <laughs> I, I work at the CFPB. So. Okay. Hey there, I'm Hannah. I'm representing an organization called New America. Their asset building oh, yeah. program is interested in strategies to promote savings for lower income Americans. And so like all of the financial products that you work on are typically tools of 
stripping wealth from low-income communities, but they also have the potential to build wealth if they're designed well and disclosures are designed well and all that. So that's why I came here. Yeah. Anyone else? And yeah, I also work at CFPB. I'm a developer. I worked on the owning a home website mm -hmm. and the form explainer tools that we kind of got a little glimpse of. If you want to talk about that, come to me. These awesome tools. Cool. I was just going to say, Numerica, it's interesting, um, this this role that think takes and, and advocacy groups play in influencing these regulations before they're made. So Pew Research Center did um, some early designs, and I know New America has been doing some early designs in the Open Tech Institute for the FCC, Open Internet Disclosures. Um, and I think, I think, I just think, I've learned a lot about that through this, sort of that relationship between think tank and government and um, it's interesting. So I think that's another way that you can, if you're interested in this work and aren't, aren't working for the government, that you can kind of get in there and start talking about these problems. Cool. Okay. Thank you for coming. Yeah. And we're hiring. Thanks. We're hiring. Yeah.